Once blood leaves the heart, it has to travel through blood vessels to get where it needs to go. Blood that is leaving the heart travels through an artery. Arteries always carry blood away from the heart. Veins always carry blood towards the heart. So let's just follow this pathway. And we've got some blood that leaves the heart and it travels through an artery. That artery is going to branch into smaller and smaller um, sorts of vessels. A small artery is called an arteriole and arterioles eventually branch into these capillary networks. Capillaries are the sites where gas exchange can happen with tissues. So oxygen can diffuse from the blood across the walls of the capillaries um, out into the surrounding tissues and waste products can diffuse from the tissues into the blood. So capillaries are uh, special in that they let things cross through the blood vessel walls. After the blood travels through the capillary beds, it will, um, those capillaries will converge, merge together and um, end up in a pathway that's headed back towards the heart. So now we're in a vein. Uh, very small veins are called venules. Venules right here is that word. And those merge together um, and eventually form very large veins. The largest vein of all is the vena cava. We saw this one before when we were talking about blood entering the heart. The inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava are what dump right into the right atrium of the heart. So three main types of blood vessels, arteries, capillaries, and veins. Know the difference between them. Let's take a look at arteries and veins. We're gonna do some comparing and contrasting for arteries and veins. Arteries and veins have similarities and they also have differences. What do they have in common? All of them have, uh, both of them have, both arteries and veins have three major layers to their wall structure. They have an outermost layer, which is just connective tissue. They have a middle layer, which is muscle. And then they have an innermost layer, which is epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue always lines things. Um, blood vessels are no different. Epithelial tissue lines the inner surface of blood vessels. Um, some of the key differences though, there are some important differences. So think in terms of the function of these two things. Arteries are carrying blood away from the heart. So the heart has just pumped and it's squeezing that blood out into an artery. That means that the blood is pretty highly pressurized at that point because it's coming directly from the pumping chamber of the heart. So arteries, Arteries need to be elastic. They need to be able to stretch to accommodate that pressure. And then they need to be able to rebound. And that rebound is, I would say, equally important. It's the rebound in the arteries that squeezes the blood along and keeps it circulating through the body. Uh, veins, on the other hand, um, by the time the blood makes it to the vein, it tends to be pretty low in pressure. So veins don't really have to accommodate that same, um, that same, they don't have to have that same level of flex. They're not quite as elastic. Um, however, veins do have to have their own special mechanisms for uh, preventing backflow. So the fact that the blood is not very pressurized anymore kind of means it doesn't necessarily have as much of a driving force to keep moving along. So veins, the things that veins have, um, which arteries do not, is that veins have valves, valves to prevent backflow. Uh, so many, in most cases, in many cases, veins, um, the pathway that veins take through the body tends to be right next to skeletal muscles. And that's actually very important. There's a picture here to, to illustrate that. Blood that is in a vein, okay, to keep that blood moving along, the skeletal muscles actually have an important role. When skeletal muscles contract, they shorten and they also get wider. And this helps to squeeze the blood along through the vein. So when this muscle right here, when it's all bulgy like this, when it's contracting, um, if there were no valves in the veins, then what would happen is blood would squeeze like in both directions along this vein. So we'd have some blood flowing in the correct direction and some blood flowing backwards. And we don't want that to happen. So the, the vein itself has valves built in so that when the muscles squeeze it, uh, the blood tends to go in one direction only, it tends to go to the heart. The presence of those valves 
It's very important in that case. And this leads us into a discussion of some of the problems that can come up with blood vessels. First on the list is gonna tie right in with these little valves, varicose veins. Okay, varicose veins happen when a vein gets, uh, gets stretched too much to the point where the valves can no longer close off the flow of blood in one direction. So when that happens, um, we, if the valve is no longer able to close off completely, then we tend to get blood just kind of pooling in certain sections of the vein. Um, so instead of being sort of partitioned into little sections, it all just kind of falls to one region in the vein and uh, it ends up looking kind of bulgy on the surface. So these are varicose veins. These generally happen in the lower limbs. Um, gravity, right? Gravity pulls blood downwards as well, so gravity is kind of contributing to this problem. And there are some specific risk factors. So there are genetic uh, risk factors that some people are more genetically susceptible to having varicose veins than others, but there are also some major lifestyle um, things that can come into play. If you have a job where you have to just sit all day, um, occupations that require a lot of sitting puts people more at risk for varicose veins. Um, if you do have a job where you have to sit, or not even necessarily a job, but if you tend to sit a lot during the day, um, that's not a good thing for multiple reasons, but it's uh, one thing that can help a lot is just to set a timer every hour, get up and move around for about five minutes, and that really helps to prevent a lot of problems. Varicose veins is, is just one of the things that that will help to prevent. So walking, um, walking can help to to reduce this sort of congestion that comes up in the veins. It makes sense, right? When you're walking, you are actively using your skeletal muscles. That'll help to squeeze the blood along. And also using compression stockings and just putting your legs up. All of those can help um, with varicose veins. There are some surgical treatments available as well. Um, they are available. Okay, another sort of problem that can come up this one is far more serious, deep vein thrombosis. This is another reason why it's important to not sit for long periods of time. Um, what this is referring to, thrombosis, right? this is clot formation. Deep vein thrombosis, so clots that form in the veins. This can happen if there's insufficient blood flow. So if the, if the blood pools and it doesn't get squeezed along uh, quickly enough, okay, what do we know about, about clot formation? Well, if blood is just sitting for a period of time, if it's not moving, then those platelets will start to stick together and this can end up leading to a clot being formed. So um, this, this isn't necessarily a problem initially when it takes place, right? If a clot forms in your leg, um, maybe that doesn't seem very serious, but this can be extremely serious because that clot then can travel, right? If the blood does, um, if that clot gets dislodged and if it starts circulating through the body, this can actually be deadly. If it lodges in the lungs, um, that's a pulmonary embolism and that can, can kill a person. So this is something that you don't want to have happening um, if a clot does form, and if it is detected, then a person can be put on blood thinners to help try and get that clot to dissolve over time. Who's at risk for this? Again, people who have to sit for long periods of time, people who choose to sit for long periods of time. Also bedridden patients, this is a concern. Um, after surgery, this is a concern. If a person doesn't get up and move around enough, if they're truly just laying in bed, um, this, this is something to, to be careful about. And we don't want deep vein thrombosis to take place. Finally, our last type of problem that we are going to mention with regards to blood vessels is atherosclerosis. This refers to hardening of the arteries. Why does hardening of the arteries happen over time? So this can happen due to buildup of plaques in the blood vessels. Okay, so plaque, um, we've got a picture of it right here. Here's a blood vessel. Here is some plaque that has built up. And then right here piled on top of it is a clot, a thrombus. And so if this gets much larger, it's going to completely cut off the blood flow. So that's not a good thing. Um, this risk factors for athero atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis, I don't say that word very often, atherosclerosis risk factors uh, would be smoking, having high blood pressure, 
um, high cholesterol, which to some extent ties in with diet, um, and then also having diabetes. All of those tend to end up leading to a higher percentage of cases of atherosclerosis. So with regards to cholesterol, we will revisit this a little bit when we walk through the digestive system that's coming up. Um, but there are two different major types of cholesterol. There's LDL and there's HDL. LDL is the bad kind. That's the one that we don't want to have a whole lot of. LDL um, can lead to this sort of plaque buildup in the arteries. HDL, on the other hand, does just the opposite. HDL actually helps to lower cholesterol levels and makes the probability of this taking place even lower. Okay, finally, our last little bit for this chapter. Um, this is starting a different section. I'm not going to give it its own video because it's so short. We'll just squeeze it in right here at the end. The lymphatic system. So the circulatory system of the body consists of two systems. The, the, the cardiovascular system, which is the heart, blood vessels, and blood, and then the lymphatic system. And put together, these two uh, make up what's called the overall circulatory system of the body. So the lymphatic system, we just are going to mention a couple of things about it right now. The lymphatic system transports fluid, excess interstitial fluid, so fluid that builds up in the tissues. Um, the lymphatic system helps to transport that to the veins. So it sort of provides a bridge between the, the tissues and the bloodstream in that sense. Uh, this is also where lymphocytes are matured, the production is, is finished in the lymphatic system, um, and then those white blood cells are stored in the lymphatic system, and they're stored kind of in reserve in case an immune response is needed. So I've got the immune system coming up, we'll go into this in far more detail when we get to that chapter. The lymphatic system is spread throughout the body. There are a few key organs. The spleen and the thymus are two of the major organs. And then we also have a lot of lymph nodes. Like I'm sure you're familiar with the ones in your neck. When you get sick, those swell up a little bit. Um, those lymph nodes are spread throughout the body. And you can see there's a whole network of vessels that extends throughout the body as well. So those are all part of the lymphatic system. The circulatory system, um, it, there's a bridge between the lymphatic system and the cardiovascular system. And so these two networks of vessels do have some innervations with each other. With the lymphatic capillaries, uh, they, they do branch out and spread into most of the organs. Um, and then those capillaries merge together to form ducts. The structure is similar to veins, but instead of carrying blood, um, these vessels carry lymph, and we will come back to that further when we talk about the immune system.